today's gonna suck. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're about to do a, this is a theory lecture. This is like deep theory lecture. If you did not like first order logic or proof by contradiction or like any of what we're about to talk about, right? If any of that has made you struggle or squeamish or any, it's all coming to fruition. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, look, it is, it, yes, if you get lost, let me know. Like that, I'm going to go ahead and give you that warning because like I had to sit down. I had to figure all this stuff out too. And it, mm, you just, you have choice words about things after you do what I did for this. Um, but again, the way I kind of frame it is, you know, some of you, if you're thinking about, hey, I see where AI is currently. I want to make that next push. I want to make you know, those attempts at AGI, artificially gen artificial general intelligence, right? That we don't have. A lot of what we're talking about today is still theory because we have not built it yet. We do not have a way to build it yet. We're still trying to figure that part out. But if we were able to build something that can do what we're about to do, congratulations, AGI is like here kind of stuff. Like if you can invent this, everybody wants to be your friend and you get to have, you know, everyone learns your name, right? Kind of stuff. That's, that's how, how pinnacle uh, this section is. And so with that, we're going to start with just telling you the knowledge base. What we are going to do today is we are going to ask a very simple question. Did curiosity kill the cat? Now, Okay, fine, that's a query. That's not the knowledge base. What's my knowledge base? Well, we know Jack owns a dog. We know that every dog owner is an animal lover. Again, closeted small universe, we'll accept that. Uh, no animal lover kills an animal. They love animals, right? Uh, either Jack or Curiosity killed Tuna. Who's Tuna? Tuna's a cat. And finally, every cat is an animal. Okay, so we've established some rules to our knowledge base, and what we are going to attempt to do today is we are going to attempt to use proof by contradiction to answer this age-old question. So, and thank you to the person who posted the PDF. So, the first thing we have to do is we have to convert this into first-order logic, and this is one of those first little problems when we think about this from an agent's perspective, right? This is English, right? We can all look at this, and we, given the fact that we have studied logic and we've studied the way to represent these statements in logic, we're able to go ahead and do that. Now, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to give that to you. Right? We talked about it. Mincing of the words, though, you know, again, you may look at this and go, oh, I don't fully agree with Right? That's one of the first hurdles is, you know, that whole translation of English to first order logic. But, you know, again, these rules, they do sort of tackle it. If you were to read through them, uh, each one sort of conveys that, especially if you were to read it explicitly in the first order logic style. You know, uh, for every X, there exists some Y, such that Y is a dog and X owns Y. If all of that is true, that would imply that X is an animal lover, right? That's all, all of that is still being conveyed, right? The original sentence is still being conveyed in our, our rule set. But fine, okay, cool, we've, we've taken care of that. So one of the things that we'll deal with specifically is this, right? I have X's, but I have X's in multiple places, and that actually becomes slightly problematic, right? Somehow X, there exists some X such that X is a dog, but every X is also a cat, right? That doesn't work. That, that, that's where we need to kind of think about this from a, a, a we got to remove the theoretical to try and make this something that we could tangibly hand over to an agent that understands, oh, that X is not the same as that X, right? So what are we doing? We're doing what we call proof by contradiction. Again, you did this. This was discrete math. 
You disliked it in discrete math. And I'm here to tell you, so what? You learn it and you accept it. Now, what is proof by contradiction trying to do? The entire idea, if you remember, is that we have a knowledge base and we have a sentence, right? I have a knowledge base, KB, and I have some sentence, some alpha that I'm working off of. And specifically, based on the rules that we have established in logic, we talk about this notion of entailment. And what entailment means is for my knowledge base to entail that sentence, alpha or that sentence needs to be valid, a.k.a. Every possible interpretation of that, again, when we bust out the truth tables and you've got the whole true false, every one of those have to evaluate into a true statement. So with that out of the way, now we have sort of, okay, if every implementation or uh, 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 consideration of alpha resolves to true, that means that not alpha the opposite of that sentence must always be false, unsatisfiable. Every iteration of it must be false. Okay, fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to, because this helps kind of solve it by finding contradictions, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, your sentence, your alpha, let's assume the opposite of it being true. Let's make the assumption Curiosity did not kill the cat. Let's do that. Because what we can then see is, well, again, either the knowledge base is true or something's wrong. Because if the knowledge base is true, that means alpha has to be true. And therefore, if the knowledge base and the opposite are true, something's wrong and broken in our entire universe. And Right? We, we call that unsatisfiable. So with that out of the way, we start looking at that again. We're trying to find alpha and not alpha. If those both are true, we have a contradiction. So again, right? alpha it must be valid. Therefore, not alpha cannot be valid. If there is no contradiction, then alpha is true. Right? So that's, that's kind of how we're looking at this. So how do we go about doing this process? And this is where the suck starts to begin. Right? The first thing that we have to do is we have to take our knowledge base, what I showed you in first order logic, and we got to go back to discrete land. Who remembers what this term stands for? Oh, I love that sneer. Something normal form? Conjunctive. There, conjunctive normal form. Conjunctive normal form, C and F. All that means is I have a bunch of things that are joined together with and statements, right? That, or jan, and operators. That's it. That's all it's looking for. But I have to convert <clears throat> this into that, right? The way you can think about it is <clears throat> Jack owns a dog and every dog owner is an animal lover and no animal lover kills an uh, animal and either Jack or, right? It's just loop in an and at the end of every one of these sentences. That's what we're going to do. Once we uh, do that, then we start looking at resolution. But we got to start here, move into resolution, and then finally we will continue to do the proof by contradiction until we get an empty set, which we will talk about. So how do I get ready for this? And this is where this is the CNF lecture. Here are the steps for converting any first order logic kind of knowledge base into a CNF format or a conjunctive normal form. First, we got to do the elimination of those implications. Those are going to be a problem. Again, think about it from designing this out as a program. You don't have an implication. You have to work off of an and or an or or a not. 
or you design an entire new language that has implication in it, okay? You do that. I'm not going to do right? Then we've got to do the De Morgans, right? We've got to bring back De Morgans and resurrect it, and then through our double negation. But rather than going through each one of these, let's actually see them in In, thank you, in action. So, again, when we're thinking about doing the, the whatchamacallit, right? When we think about the implication, right? When I'm dealing with just any implication, again, the P implies Q, the entire idea is that there is an equivalence for this that we can also work off of, right? That equivalence is now, oh, well, either not P, or Q. Remember, again, when we think implication, if this is true, we're implying that Q is true. If Q were to never, it, like again, this is where if this were a false statement, right? how do we evaluate? We assume the entire thing's broken because our implication was wrong, right? We are assuming, we're making that assumption. So as we're looking at this, this is our first approach, right? We are going to take that cat X and we are going to negate it, right? Either X is not a cat or X is an animal. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, right? When we're dealing with biconditionals or that if and only if the, the double implication is what is going on here, what ends up happening is it's a two-step process, right? It becomes P implies Q and Q implies P, right? Okay, well, I just, you know, all I did was put some parentheses around the implication, right? You can immediately see, oh, that would get translated into not P or Q and not Q or P, right? That's it. It's just both of those statements have to be true. Okay, fine. That part, not terrible. It's mostly about making sure you get uh, your, your negations in the right spot uh, because that's typically where the logic breaks in your brain. So, okay. But what about that, that for all? And you'll notice I'm saying, hey, we'll just deal with that in a second. That is not the next thing in the list that... Dr. G, when he showed the slide, it was a numbered list, a.k.a. there are a set order of steps that need to be followed. So we're not at dealing with universal quantifiers right now. We're just focusing on, hey, let's convert these into their equivalences. So now what? And this is where De Morgan's Law comes back. Like I said, it was going to come back to haunt you. And baby, it's Halloween season, right? Yeah, so again, we have to be mindful of it. All of this will be on your midterm, so you, you, the equivalences will be on your midterm, so you do not have to put them on your notes, but you will have to do this. So, you know, you, you know that that's going to be coming. So again, we've got our different ones. I won't, won't go through each one, but again, it's the driving of those negations into a parentheses. And you've done this before, right? If I were to have, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of it. Yeah, I'll just do that, right? If I were to drive that negation inward, yes, I know I could combine them. That's not what I'm trying to get at. If I'm driving that negation inward, what becomes the next design. It becomes, right, this whole new process going on there, right? It's the equivalence happening, right? Technically, that's the same. That's where there's slight differences going on here because that's logic and this is math. But the point I'm trying to get at is we're just, we make that same kind of flip is the logic I want you to think about. So from here, this is where, you know, our knowledge base doesn't really have a good one, but I want to demonstrate this uh, as something that you could see, right? Um, so in that case, maybe it's the rule for what animal lover turns out to be, right? Okay, 
So we see this giant blah, right? All it translates to is everyone who loves all animals is loved by someone, right? Okay, everyone who loves all animals, loved by someone, fine. And you can see it has its own uh, uh, first order logic representation. Now, once again, we have to take this and do the entire conversion process with it. It's not just I do one step, right? Just like we did before. I've got implications that I have to deal with, right? So how do I tackle them? First thing I'm going to focus on, my approach, is I'm going to tackle them one at a time. I like to kind of, I don't like to try and do multiple things uh, at once because it never works. Uh, so in this situation, I'm going to just tackle my first implication, right? The innermost parentheses implication first. You know, that's, that's my preference for this because PEMDAS, right? But, all right, that's going to get negated. That's going to, or sorry, that's going to get negated. That's going to become its or statement. Boom. We're good so far. I haven't, to, to quote my AI professor, even though I hated this sentence when he said it, the fingers have not left the hand. All right. So we're all good? Anyone lost yet? All right, let's start detaching fingers. <laughs> so the next approach, again, I'm still in that first phase, right? I'm still on step one of getting rid of my implications. So I have not even gotten to step two. I've got to get rid of this implication now, right? Okay, well, again, that's going to become an or. And notice, this is all one giant parentheses, right? The way I want you to think about it, beep is that's my P, there's my implication, Beep. there's my Q, right? So all I'm doing when I, I make this conversion is, again, that becomes the or, that becomes a negation, right? Boom! So there we have it. Now I, I am putting it inside the parentheses. That's mostly, um, for my sake, uh, the, by design. So again, I've taken care of that, right? Okay, fine, we're good-ish, but we have more problems. What are those problems, pray tell? Well, now we're in step two. We're in that driving in those negations. I do not like the fact that this is out here, right? I want to drive it inward. I want to push that in because, again, I'm going to be dealing with that negation. So I have to look up in my wonderful guide. And the way I want you to also think is technically there's some parentheses going on here, right? They're invisible uh, to the eye, but here you go. There. Now, they're not so invisible to the eye. And so what's going to happen? Well, again, thinking about this from De Morgan's kind of perspective, let's just try and unpack that little bit there. I've got a negation of a for all to uh, some y, not animal, y, or loves x, y. So if we're looking at this, I have to drive in those different negations, right? So I am bringing them in. Now, this is where, yes, I, I, I probably need to be doing uh, something with the, the, this portion here. This is me talking to myself. Um, luckily, that won't necessarily be a big issue later on. Uh, so you know, that's not really the part I'm trying to get at. More to my point is here, right? Mm -hmm. I'm pushing it inward. And I continue pushing it inward because, again, look at the DeMorgans. Look at what I need to be doing. It's not just the flip. This is where that 1 minus 2 came in. Yeah? I can, it's not, 
I can. There you go. It's not, mostly in the sense it's, it's not going to help us for this example. Like, and we'll, we'll see this much later on as we get through the deeper steps. Like, I could just keep it as for all. I know I shouldn't. I'm, right? The logic gods are coming out to, I don't know, prove me wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Right? Uh, in that case, like, keeping it the A, you know, I'm, I'm breaking some rules in logic, uh, which, again, I already made the joke, so laugh again. Uh, if I made it uh, an existential, that also works. Cool. So, again, as we're kind of working through this, again, you see, hey, I've got that double negation. And so, again, we just get rid of that. Cool. Groovy. We're all good. Anything else? Anyone seeing that we, we need to take care of? Maybe, could you explain why this doesn't like violate the original? Like, this isn't different from the original statement. Uh, why is the not the y is an animal and x does not love y? Correct. That was a great segue. Thank you. So everything again. This is the so we've made these conversions, right? We're trying to maintain the exact same translation. But because we're making these equivalencies, this is where brain hurt. And honestly, that's how I describe it. Brain hurt start. Uh, because, right, everyone, oh, I, you know, for alls and love, like all that makes sense. I can represent that statement in the original logic. But once I start making these equivalences, things start to like... This is, again, my brain trying to wrap my head on the English sentence starts to, even my English, start breaking bad, right? The equivalence, again, if we're looking at the original statement, again, everyone who loves all animals is loved by someone, right? Everyone who loves all animals is loved by someone. So when we've made this translation, if we were to continue reading it, right, if we were to continue reading it, either, and this is where I, you know, should be having these flipped a little bit, either there is some animal that X does not love or someone loves X, right? Or this really hasn't changed, right? That we didn't really do much to this side of the equation, but we did a lot to this side. And again, some animal that X does not love. Original sentence. Everyone, let's again think about that X. X, if you love all animals, you are loved by someone. That was the rule. Now, either there is some animal that you do not love, X does not love, or someone loves X. So we're still in that 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 rule, but now we've sort of taken the negated version of that. You either love all animals, or X would love all animals, or some animal X does not love, right? So again, as we're kind of, there is some, if we clear out, there is some animal X does not love, right? That, that is all I'm saying here. There's some animal X does not love, so, yes, that should be a sum. I will correct it. Or someone loves X. Okay. Again, this is where, if you're getting lost, I'm doing my best. I will keep you as best I can uh, along for this ride because I, you can see, look, I got the crazy eyes today. Right? It is. Yeah, this is what happens when you sit down and try and figure out logic, everyone. My point being, we move on. Okay, all right, well, we did the conversion. We're done. We're, we were done with that sentence. So we move on to the next one. Now, technically, as this is all occurring, all of these are happening to every single one of my knowledge statements. And we'll see you in a refresher in a little bit. But 
we get back to that problem. I told you that somehow we had a, one variable, x. x was representing that there exists some x that's a dog, but also every x is a cat, right? Think about that just logically for a second. That, that, that doesn't make sense, right? Or just think about that like as a human without any logic for a second, right? I just said that x has to be a dog and a cat, and look, Cat dog was my generation. Y'all don't even know that that was a cartoon, right? Some of y'all just got offended. Guess what? I don't care. My back hurts. I got gray hair. I'm allowed to make fun of the youth now, right? My point being, I have that also elsewhere, right? Oh, notice, uh, if, I, if I start looking at these, I've got, you know, uh, you know, there exists some Y such that Y is a dog and X owns Y. Well, and then I also have like X is an animal lover. Uh, and Y is an animal. The problem with this is, right, as I start looking at trying to do the proof, we are going to be dealing with a conjunctive normal form. Everything is one giant and statement or conditional statement combined with ands. So if I were to make a substitution, right, oh, swap X for blank, I'm swapping it in every instance of X, right? It, that becomes a major issue. So rather than this, the first thing, again, we got to do the same thing that we did before. We got implementations. We got to make those conversions. We've got to do the DeMorean's power all over again. But hopefully I've, I've spent enough time ranting and raving about that. So I'm going to do this. Ta-da, it's done. So, and again, if you want, this is where sit down, uh, make a post on Piazza. I will work through them. This is much more of a, I don't want to spend too much time on this step because I still have to prove, I still got a cat murder I got to deal with, right? So, you know, again, <clears throat> if we take a look at this, I've converted both of these statements into De Morgan's. Uh, so we've got, you know, for all X, there is some Y where X, Y is either not a dog or X does not own Y or X is an animal lover, right? So all of that's being taken care of. I'm going to do a little bit more polish, mostly in the sense because I had some, right? I, I, I had, or was it, right? I've got some additional parentheses going on here, right? This is where, oh, I can't remember what that term is from, you know, that you learn about, like, oh, this is an or, and then this is just another or. So do I need to have, you know, a P or Q where Q is just two more ors? No. So I kind of cleaned it up a little bit, right? X or Y or Z, right? Or uh, A or B or C. So I just got rid of parentheses, that's all. But again, what's our step? Our step is... I need to standardize my variables. The issue is, remember, right, this is combined with an and statement. This sentence and this sentence, right? This is, that's the point of conjunctive normal form. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, oh, because that may cause some problems, Let's just use different variables for this fact. Let's just, let's not have the same variables for every one of our facts. Let's just use a different set. Boom, done, right? That's all we're looking to do is say, hey, you know, because we're dealing with a number of different facts, we may be dealing with, you know, multiple variables. Let's go ahead and make sure that each one of the facts have their own unique variables so that we, we don't have, we, we're not ever making a cross-reference that we shouldn't be, right? That's it. Uh, so, okay, we've taken care of that. We've worked through that. Now what? Well, now, yeah. Because that may not be, it, that's where, yes, that, yes. If you start that way, that's great. If you do not, <laughs> that's where that comes in. Uh, that's mostly in the sense of like when you're reading up your logic papers uh, or you read up on some of these rules. Uh, on Wednesday, we're going to talk about knowledge representation or trying to actually like create rules. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's just, yes, this one is designed to make it easier on all our lives. Um, the reason why we're doing it sort of middle of the road instead of first is we may have actually created, just to kind of pull up the equivalencies again, there is the chance we may have created like new conjunctive normal forms, right? Because if you notice, our additional kind of facts with our ands. Um, mm -hmm. So where are we? We are here. So now we get to one of those $5 words that definitely hurts the brain, uh, scolemization. Scolemization. I will go ahead and tell you, you won't need to worry about this one for the point of like grading. Right? I, I, I'm going, anything I give you, I'm not going to ask you to create some new arbitrary term because I don't want to see what you create. Again, I've seen what you create. It's terrifying. Uh, some of y'all got some messed up minds. Uh, my point being is the issue is those existentials, right? What is the existential even doing? There exists some. There exists some student playing video games right now who wants to admit it. Right? No, so the problem is because it's just there's some, right? Some just means at least one. And we may be dealing with, uh, you know, again, if we're thinking about the, the structure of those symbols, every, at least one. Okay, fine. If there is at least one, quantify it is all we're saying. That's it. If there's at least one, quantify it for the purpose of our proof by contradiction is a, uh, for our resolution to resolve this query. Again, to, uh, to determine and answer a question where you have some, there's at least one, give me, give me additional context, quantify them. So when we're dealing with something like, oh, if we looked at there exists some X and Jack owns X, right? In this case, this is where we have an issue. We have this problem of, well, what dog? There is some dog, right? There's at least one dog that Jack owns. No. We're going to just go ahead and quantify it. Right? It's no longer just some dog. We've given this dog a name. It exists now. It's not just an amorphous something. It's a person. It's a dog, <laughs> right? It's an actual dog. So in this case, there now exists a dog, not some dog. There is a dog, and we've named it Poppers. That's a little cute derivative of Puppers, which is a derivative of puppy, like dogs. So we got Poppers, and Jack owns Poppers. Good? Uh -huh. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Get your picture in. I, I, want, I need my Instagram updates. Wasting time. Anyway, so we got poppers. Boom! Now, we got a poppers, but we're not done. All that did was get rid of those, right? All it was doing was getting rid of the existentials. It did not get rid of my universals. Now, herein is where things are great. Because I've gotten rid of all the existentials, and because I've standardized the variables, do I actually need to explicitly state for all of a variable? No, because some of them, some of those variables don't have that, and then some of them do. And any of them that were like, a, a, you know, just a only, you know, a subset, the existentials, we quantified them. So now our rules, essentially, we don't need this. It's excess. So I no longer need that whole, hey, for every Z, for every T. Because again, those variables will only appear in this sentence in this fact or in this rule. And again, because I'm going to be making substitutions off these variables, that's all it is. It's just an amorphous thing that's floating in space. I can just drop them. And so this is where that process of 
getting it to turn into code or into a, a programmatic knowledge base or like if statements becomes very beneficial. Because notice, I've gotten rid of the implications. I'm now starting to get rid of like these logic symbols that I don't really have a method for representing in modern programming, like the sum or now this for all. So I drop them, I just get rid of them, right? It didn't change my statement, right? Just uh, either Z is not an animal lover, or T is not an animal, or Z did not kill T, right? I just don't include the sum or the for every, right, in the beginning of my sentence, but it's still existing. Now, again, this is just me doing that example elsewhere. Like, I'm just saying, uh, you know, for every A, getting rid of that for every, and now, you know, either A is not a cat or A is an animal. Questions? Because we're almost done. There was one final step, and this is where I'm going to go ahead and cheat. You got to do the distributive law. Because again, we need to put this into dis uh, conjunctive normal form, not DNF, not disjunctive, right? Conjunctive. So if you find yourself in that situation, right, where somewhere in your uh, your knowledge base, you're dealing with like an or clause that you want or clauses inside of their own sentences, their own facts. But if you find yourself like as you were building and constructing this, if at some point it turned into a weird like amorphous thing, we want to convert it, right? Again, we want that conjunction. We want these facts because the Remember, think about what an and is. Both sides of it need to be true. If they are not, think about it from a short-circuiting perspective, right? That's what you learned with conditional statements all the way back in the day. Well, if this turns out to be true, I don't need to evaluate this second statement because short circuit, no, you get rid of it. So in my case, we didn't have any in our knowledge base, which is great me. Again, something to be mindful of, though. Now, we've hit every rule. And so let's do a refresher, right? So again, what we needed to do, that was step one. I just spent, what, 40, 45 minutes on step one. You haven't even had an opportunity to like work with your peers yet. And you're still not. No, you got a lot more to work on, right? We converted. All of this, we have established everything in the CNF or the, the, the conjunctive normal form. Now what? Now we get to do resolution. Now we are going to run through the proof by contradiction to answer that query, right? So how do we kind of deal with this? Again, what we're looking for is this idea of variable substitution. What can we look at? We have a ton of rules, right? Where do we make substitutions on those rules? And what is the product of them? If I substitute X for poppers and Y for Tom, on the fact or on this kind of predicate of X owns Y, what gets produced, right? Oh, X becomes poppers. Tom becomes Y. So poppers is owned by Tom. So again, it's, it's stuff we've seen. If it's things that we've played around with. But it is, we do this so that we can, what's the word I'm looking for? We do this so that we can now answer those queries, right? Oh, can we make some assumptions based on what we've seen, and remember the joke about assumptions, right? They make a butt out of you and me. Uh, but the point I'm trying to get at is we're going to have to do some assumptions, and if we find we make those assumptions, proof by contradiction is saying, well, you can't. You cannot assume blank because that would contradict blank, right? So again, here's that knowledge base. We took that, we converted it into first-order logic. 
Now we're going to walk through every single one of those steps to build these structures out, right? So there exists some X such that X is a dog and X is owned by Jack. Well, one, I quantified that sum X. I named it poppers. And because it's a conjunctive normal form, right, those are technically, or sorry, since we're dealing with uh, the and block on this, well, technically those are two separate facts already uh, lined up in my conjunctive normal form. So I'm just sort of representing them as their own different rules for this case because poppers, or dog poppers and uh, own poppers jack or need to be true. Those are in the knowledge base. Good. Now we move on to every dog owner is an animal. For every X, there exists some Y such that Y is a dog and X owns Y. That would imply X is an animal lover. Okay. I do some hand waving. Again, fingers are not leaving the hands, but the hands are definitely, the fingers are definitely wiggling. Right? In that case, X is not a dog or X does not own Y or, or sorry, uh, X is not owned by Y or Y is an animal lover. One of these statements has to be true, right? That only one of them needs to be true for this entire batch to work, right? That's, that's the only thing we got to worry about. Then, no animal lover kills an animal. Either Z is not an animal lover, or T is not an animal, or Z did not kill T. Good, good. I see the energy and the focus and the brain. There's a lot of processing power happening in this classroom right now. Thank goodness I just have to read my slides. I had to do all this once upon a time. Again, my point being, either Jack kills uh, uh, Tuna or Curiosity kills Tuna. Again, that one we don't need to touch, right? It's already in CNF form. Only one of these statements needs to be true for this fact to be true, right? And we're all making an assumption here, right? Okay, well, we, we're, that just makes an assumption, right? Oh, you know, uh, did curiosity kill tuna? Let's assume it's true. Ta-da. And that didn't answer the question, right? It just, we assumed it. So, again, we're there. Cool. Tuna is a cat. That's already taken care of. I don't need to mess around with that one. So that's just a fact. I listed it in my rows. Uh, and then the last one, uh, not a, uh, M is not a cat or M is an animal. Those are the, the kind of equivalences going on here because we're saying that every cat is an animal. Well, either you're an animal or you're not a cat, right? That's the equivalence here. So now we tackle the final portion. Remember, we're doing proof by contradiction. What does proof by contradiction mean? It means we are going to attempt to prove the opposite of our query. Can I prove the opposite of my query is true? Right? If I can, OK, well, then we run into the opposite was true. But if I cannot, if I cannot prove curiosity did not kill tuna. And again, we got to go all the way back. All the way back. There it is, right? We got to go all the way back because everything that I've just produced must be true or the knowledge base cannot entail this negated out or this alpha. So, I'm going to attempt to find contradictions along the way. I've built out the knowledge base. I made technically an assumption. Now I'm going to see, did I break anything in here? If there are things that have been broken, again, the negation cannot be true is where I'm getting at. OK. So now we get into the fun part. The part I can warn you about. The part that clearly has a note talking about midterm two. You're going to get this. 
This is going to be a page on your midterm. You are going to see it on a study guide too, so don't worry. This is, again, this is my way of saying, here's how I want you to solve this problem. This is the format to work off of. Follow this approach, and hopefully it works. Knock on wood. So, again, I've listed out every single one of those rules. I've given them a number. And I've kind of lined out some blank spaces. You will not know the correct number of spaces. I'm going to give you more than you need. I know. Oh, I love the stink face right there. He's like, oh. that's not a trick question. I'm just not, again, I'm not going to make it so that, oh, I just need one more statement. I'm done. No, I'm, you know, you have to be able to evaluate when you're done. So, Again, I have made an assumption. The assumption is curiosity did not kill tuna. The opposite of my question. Okay, fine. The opposite is going to happen. Now, just off the, the bat, do I have any contradictions in my facts? Because, again, every one of these facts must be true right now. There's a very glaring one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. If you look at that, look, right? I've got a statement where, where, there you are. I got a statement. I make an assumption. Let's assume that's a true statement. Well, if I assume that's a true statement, I, have, oh, I already have a contradiction in my, based on this assumption. Because curiosity cannot kill and not kill tuna at the same time. That does not work. That's a contra. So what have I effectively done? I've found a contradiction, but that's fine, right? Because we're in assumption land. We're allowed to find contradictions here. Does that solve everything? No, because if I'm making an assumption that curiosity did not kill tuna and ki curiosity killed tuna cannot coexist, I've now created another assumption. I have created the assumption that Jack killed Tuna. And specifically, this is where one of the things I'm going to ask you and what you typically have to do in a proof is you have to provide your evidence. Now, in this case, you don't have to explain your evidence. I'm being generous, right? Hey, that rule five and that rule eight or those facts that you have, fact five and fact eight, they have a contradiction. And if we were to clean up the contradiction, you're left with this in your assumption. And so I've used the analogy in the past of like a gumball machine here. This is my gumball analogy. It does not properly work, but it's, it, it's how my brain has solved this, right? Gumball machine, right? You've all seen a gumball machine. You've spent money on a gumball machine. You shouldn't have, but you've spent money on the gumball machine. you got a coin. Now, imagine, if you will, that the gumball machine is filled with additional coins. When you put this in, it's almost a little like a you know, slot machine. When I put you know, my coin, just I'm going to call it alpha, in, what I'm going to get out is some new coin, or some new coins. And the game of proof by contradiction is I gotta get rid of all the coins. Anytime I put something in, turn the crank, if I got stuff out, right, I gotta get rid of these. I gotta get rid of my X. If I, this X, right, I have to get, if I can get rid of it, right, I have too many contradictions. But if I'm left over with change, Right? Technically, the assumption could be true. So in this case, now I've got another assumption i got to get rid of, is my point. That's where I'm getting at. So now that that's kind of squared away, I also have a few other assumptions that I could be dealing with. Now, I'll go ahead and cheat on this one before instead of asking. Specifically because, well, since we're making assumptions, I can assume anything I want. I can assume you know, substitutions based on this. Because again, it's all, we're all just playing make-believe right now. We're just assuming, we're just assuming. 
specifically, well, hey, I, if, if we're in assumption land, you know, I could find a contradiction by making a substitution. If I were to swap that m variable with tuna, right, then I would have a contradiction specifically on lines six and seven. You know, and that, that contradiction would be that, you know, cat is a tuna and also cat is not a tuna. Or sorry, tuna is not a cat, right? See, I told you the brain. Uh, but I see where I am on time. So again, that becomes its own, right? Then what? Well, again, if I continue to make more assumptions, in this case, oh, if we were to substitute Zach, or Z for Jack and we substituted T for tuna, right, we could also get rid of that kills statement, right? Because we made an assumption, right? That became an assumption that we, we kept going. So I got rid of it, but again, it produced more contradictions. So in this case, uh, now, Either animal is not, or Jack is not an animal lover, or tuna is not an animal. The problem is, you already see where this is going. I've got two assumptions that contradict each other. Tuna is an animal, and tuna is not an animal. Oh, also, that's, um, I, I just listed that up there. So that's, right, contradiction. So I'm left with animal or Jack is not an animal lover. And notice, again, I'm also stating where these rules are happening, how I'm building these assumptions and whatnot matters. Now, in this case, right, I keep on going well, because I can continue making assumptions. Specifically, you see that line three, uh, I can make more assumptions. If I were to swap out the Y with Jack, well, again, I have some contradictions going on that Jack is either an animal lover or not an animal lover. So that's left, and that's supposed to have a line through it and be bolded, whatever. Uh, so again, if that's the case, now I'm left with, well, either dog is not, uh, or X is not a dog, or X is not owned by Jack. You already can kind of hopefully see where that X needs to go. That needs to become a substitution, right? Oh, since we're in assumption land, let's assume X is poppers. Let's assume X is poppers. Well, if X is poppers, I got contradictions because poppers is a dog, but I just said that poppers is not a dog. That doesn't work. And so now I have another contradiction or I have another negation going on here that uh, poppers is not owned by Jack. And you already, again, I've made a, con I have a con conflicting statements. Rule two says that poppers is owned by Jack. But rule 14 is saying that it's not. And so now I want you to notice, right? The only thing I have left based on this proof by contradiction is just some rule. Just some rule. No new facts. No, no, nothing generated in my assumption. I've effectively gotten rid of every single one of those assumptions. Look. I got rid of those. I got rid of this is why I was crossing out everything along the way is every assumption I made, I was able to contradict and get rid of. And so now all I'm left with is just a rule. Well, rule's a rule. It's not a fact. It's not an assumption, right? And so as a consequence, I have what we call an empty set. I have found an empty set in my proof by contradiction. This is how I would ask that you point this out, again, on the midterm. And what this is to indicate is that there are no more assumptions that I have to deal with. I have nothing else that is just an assumption, right? All of the things that I was assuming got contradicted. And what that is meaning is that the knowledge base that I did have and this negation of my alpha will never be true. It's impossible to make it true. Right? There are implementations where it could be false. And so as a result, right, this is me almost working backwards on my logical statement. Since Jack owns poppers, poppers is a dog, that would mean that Jack is an animal lover. Good so far? Good, good. Well, animal lover, if Jack's an animal lover, that would mean he couldn't have killed 
curiosity because animal lovers would never kill an animal. And thus, curiosity killed the cat. Ah! I know. Yeah. Ah. Big brain, big brain. Ah, be very smart. Yeah. No, I get it, right? Look, all this big, and this is celebrate, right? This is, what, this is what you felt when you made your first test case or your first test program, and it worked, right? You remember the, the hell yeah moment? Ah, oh, we just worked through this whole thing, and I, I, I whew, a lot of blood went to my brain. <laughs> you know? So I will say this. Again, I see where I am on time. This group exercise, I do not have enough time to give you to work on it. Uh, so you have the opportunity. I would say, please work on this in your own free time, even prior to the midterm. And likewise, there is that worked example. So this is going to be unlocking, in essence, uh, in a minute and a half. I work through it. I'm not going to give the spoilers away through it. But work through it. See if you can get the same results as the best I can give you. And so with that... Go have some ice cream. Go get a treat at Port City Java because your brain is on fire right now and lightly melted. Have a good one. I will see you on Wednesday.